It's the week after Easter. Some call this day a low Sunday. Low in attendance, low in energy, a religious hangover. But this week is not a low Sunday, not to you and not to us. Because we recognize that when the risen Christ burst forth from that tomb, he went on the move and didn't stop moving. Easter kept happening. In fact, nearly one week after his resurrection, Jesus presented himself alive to Thomas, the most famous skeptic in all of history. And he said to him, Here I am. Go on. Touch my hands. Examine. Take your finger and put it in my side. Do what it takes to find belief. Thomas responded, My Lord and my God. Easter kept happening. Easter is not just a one-time phenomenon. The redemptive power that came alive in Christ's resurrection is as powerful and alive today as it was then. When God works in and through our lives, Easter happens. When we invite the stranger, when we help the poor, when we visit the sick, clothe the naked, feed the hungry, or bring peace to those whose hearts are troubled, Easter happens. Whatever excitement and exuberance we experience on Easter Sunday is alive and present and available every day, every hour, every second. Low Sunday? I don't think so. Because Easter keeps happening. Hi. I'm Pastor Mark McDonald of First United Methodist Church, and I am so glad that you have chosen to be with us in this way today. First United Methodist Church has been an active part of serving this community, state, nation, and world for over 175 years, and we are alive and well today. We have vibrant youth and children's ministries, adult ministries. We have feeding ministries and ways to serve our community that are endless. And I hope that you will find a place here where you can feel like you belong and that you are serving in the way that God has created you to serve. So I invite you to go to our our website and look through the things of our church, learn more about us. Visit our Facebook page, see what's going on all the time here. Or visit our YouTube channel and join us in worship in other ways as you can see what it's like to be part of this church. Please let us know if there's anything we can do to be your pastor or church and let us know ways that we can help you grow in your walk as we love God, love others, and serve the world. Thank you and God bless. It's good to be with you again this morning and today I'm joining you from the Cheney Huddleston Sunday School class. I miss everybody here on Sunday mornings, but I am so grateful that we are able to join together in worship in this very special way and connect in so many other ways in the weeks that we have been separated from one another and in the weeks that will come. I'm excited this week we begin to hear that the curve in Arkansas is beginning to flatten and we know that there may be a chance that it could go up again, but we are seeing fruits of our labor as we are responsible and taking care of ourselves, washing our hands, keeping our social distance and staying at home when we can. Thank you for being part of that part of the cure. Uh, As we move ahead, we're going to hear more and more conversations about the ways we may begin to come back together in the coming weeks or months. And as we do that, I want to assure you that our leaders are beginning to meet this week even as we begin to discuss the things that we need to do to be safe and responsible in that response as well. So I am delighted that we have that conversation beginning, but I am here to assure you that we are going to be careful and cautious, and I look forward to the day when we get to be together again. Of course, in the meantime, I invite you to join me on Wednesday nights at 5.30 on our Facebook page where we have an update with the pastor every Wednesday at 5.30. I share some of the information of things that are going on behind the scenes at the church and have a chance for questions and answers as well. You can type in the questions and make your comments. I also invite you to join us in our daily devotionals that take place every morning about eight o'clock. On Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, we'll have what we have been doing with morning devotionals. Joel and Alicia have been presenting some wonderful devotional videos. We'll have other staff, maybe members of the church that will share in those devotionals as well. On Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays, I'm going to begin a devotional series this week called Making All Things New. And we're going to begin the devotional process of considering the ways that we will be changed 
as we come through this. Remember that our newsletter is being mailed out every week, but we do want to get your emails. Uh, so if something goes wrong and we're not able to mail them one week, we want to email them to as many people as possible. Lastly, I want to tell you that last Sunday, Easter Sunday, was a wonderful Sunday with over 250 people joining us online and worship on YouTube at 9 o'clock and who knows how many during the radio service at 11 o'clock. We also had over 250 people join us for communion on YouTube at 9 o'clock and Facebook Live at noon. So what an exciting way to move through this time and show the world that Easter is a time of new things. As we continue in worship this morning, I'm delighted that we are going to be blessed by two very special artists from Central United Methodist Church in Fayetteville, Arkansas, who are sharing a prelude on piano and organ. Please use this time to prepare your minds, your hearts, and the place you are in for this sacred encounter with God that we will experience. As we continue in worship, God bless.
Hey guys, it's Miss Ricky. I'm so glad to be here with you today. Let's do what we do in the sanctuary. I'm going to say good morning, everybody, and you answer good morning, children. Are you ready? Good morning, everybody. Nice. That makes me feel at home. I'm so glad that you're here with us. I have something to share with you. I want you to see something that I went to the store and bought this week. Here it is. It's a can of air. Yeah, I know. A can of air is kind of a funny thing to buy, but I have a specific purpose for it. I need to clean my computer. And so this can of air sprays air out this little nozzle and it cleans all the dust and debris and stuff out of the inside of my computer where I don't really want to touch. And I certainly don't want to get in there with a rag that may scratch it up real bad. So I bought this bottle and it's going to help me get my computer cleaned. You want to see? Watch. Did you see it? Yeah, me neither. Um, I hope the store didn't try to sell me an empty bottle. I didn't see anything come out when I sprayed that, pushed that button and sprayed that nozzle. Okay, I've got an idea. Let me try it a different way. I'm gonna hold my hand up here and I'm gonna spray it into my hand. Oh, okay. That time I could feel it on my hand. I couldn't see it, but I could feel it on my hand. So I know there's something in this bottle. Even though I can't see it, I know it's there. I wish you were here with me because I would spray a little bit in your hand too so you could feel it. But sometimes we just have to believe things are there that we can't actually see. But you know what? Our story today is a little like that. Our story is about Thomas. Thomas is one of Jesus' disciples. And after Jesus' death and resurrection, Happy Easter, the disciples were all together in a room that had a locked door. And while they were in there, Jesus appeared to them. Oh my gracious, Jesus was there. The disciples were so excited. Jesus told them, peace be with you. And they could not believe that their Savior was back. Jesus left the room. Thomas was the only one that wasn't there. So a little later on that afternoon, Thomas showed up, and the disciples were still so excited about Jesus coming back and visiting with them. So he, Thomas, got to hear the story about Jesus coming. Well, Thomas was not real sure about the story. He wasn't there. He didn't get to see Jesus with his own eyes. And he was having a hard time believing his friends when they said that they had seen him. So eventually, Jesus does come back to that room, and Thomas is there this time, thank goodness. And Thomas gets to see Jesus, and Thomas then believes, yes, Jesus was resurrected. I saw him with my own eyes. But while there, Jesus tries to remind Thomas of a very important lesson. Sometimes we have to believe in things that we don't actually get to see with our own eyes. We have a special name for that, and we call it faith. Faith is the ability to believe in something that we didn't actually see. God's love is sort of like the air. We can feel it fill up our hearts, even though sometimes we don't actually get to see it. I know that Jesus is here. I know that Jesus is always with us and he's always surrounding us and his presence and his love is always with us. I may not be able to see it with my own eyes, but I know it's there. Will you pray with me? Dear God, sometimes we are asked to believe in things that we don't actually get to see. But like the air, we know that we are surrounded with your presence and your love. Help us to live a faithful life now and forever. Amen. Bye, guys.
Good morning. Welcome. This is a time of prayer for the people. And I'd like to ask you to join me in this prayer. And also, I will say, Lord, in your mercy, and then we can all say together, hear our prayers. So please, let us join together. Almighty God, you are the greatest and the most magnificent you are the all-powerful and almighty God. And we know you only by a portion of you. We want to know you better. So help us to set aside a time in this changed world so that we may come to know you. Just as Jesus set himself apart, and was alone and prayed to you. Let us do the same. Father, we pray for all those who are <clears throat> suffering from the disease of the coronavirus. We pray for your healing touch upon them. We pray for their families as they wait to hear the news about them. And we rejoice with those who have been healed of this disease. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We pray for those who are on the front lines, dear Father, the doctors, the nurses, the medical technicians, the surgical techs, everyone who is involved with treating these coronavirus victims. We pray for them that you will put your protection around them. Those that are sick, please heal. And those who are just tired of the relentless onslaught of cases, who are exhausted from long hours, Strengthen them, dear Father, so that they may continue to do their job. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayers. We pray for the policemen, the firefighters, the emergency technicians that are out there that are having initial contacts with old people. Their day-to-day -day job in normal circumstances is hard enough, but with the added stress of the coronavirus and the, the sickness of their colleagues and everything, they need your strengthening, dear Father. We lift them up to you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For all those that are in the military, whether here in the United States or overseas or at sea, Father, we just pray for your guidance and direction for them, your protection over them, so that they may not experience this disease as others have. And those who are sick with it, please heal them. Heal them quickly so that they may be whole. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And Father, we pray for all those who lead countries, whether it's countries overseas or our countries. We pray for all the leaders that you may guide them and direct them so that they will do what is best for the people. What is best to keep this virus in check. We pray that you will just fill them with your knowledge and your love 
so that it may reach out to all those that they affect. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And we have come to lift up these prayers because your Son taught us how to pray when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you. Have a blessed Sunday, and a blessed week, and we'll see you next week. scripture selection this second Sunday of Easter. Please pray with me. God of peace and promise, in today's scripture reading, we identify with the disciples of Jesus who hid behind locked doors 
and we identify with Thomas needing assurance of the risen Christ. By the power of your Holy Spirit, breathe on us breath of God that we may have resurrection faith and experience the transformation that new life in Christ brings. Amen. Our scripture reading is John 20, verses 19 through 31, and it is taken from the Common English Bible. It was still the first day of the week. That evening, while the disciples were behind closed doors because they were afraid of the Jewish authorities, Jesus came and stood among them. He said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. When the disciples saw the Lord, they were filled with joy. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you don't forgive them, they aren't forgiven. Thomas, the one called Didymus, one of the twelve, wasn't with the disciples when Jesus came. The other disciples told him, We've seen the Lord. But he replied, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, put my finger in the wounds left by the nails, and put my hand into his side, I won't believe. After eight days, his disciples were again in a house, and Thomas was with them. Even though the doors were locked, Jesus entered and stood among them. He said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. Look at my hands. Put your hand into my side. No more disbelief. Believe. Thomas responded to Jesus, My Lord and my God. Jesus replied, Do you believe because you see me? Happy are those who don't see and yet believe. Then Jesus did many other miraculous signs in, in his disciples' presence, signs that aren't recorded in this scroll. But these things are written so that you will believe that Jesus is the Christ, God's Son, and that believing you will have life in his name. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning and happy Easter again. Uh, we gather together in this Easter season, and I thank all those who help us to pull together this time of worship. We've had so many people working together on music, children's sermons, announcements, work behind the scenes, and, and certainly the scripture reading as Joni just shared in. And so we're excited to be able to continue to worship uh, in this way until we can get back together again in worship and fellowship and time together. I ask that you go to God with me in prayer. O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, we've had several weeks together like this, and as you know, a lot of times I like to share some clips. I found a funny Easter clip that is in the spirit of the television show, The Office. And so I want to start off today because you're wondering what people are thinking about Easter. Here it is the Sunday after our first Easter that has been in the middle of COVID-19. Hopefully the only Easter we'll experience quite like this. But I want you to watch this clip and, and ask yourself the question, what are other people saying about Easter now? I bet you a hundred dollars my boss can't tell you the real reason behind Easter. Can I explain the origin of Easter? Yes, I can. It's pretty uh, self-explanatory, really. Uh, you see, in the old days, they used to revere the rabbit for its fleet-footedness, which makes total sense. Uh, and they told the children this story that if they were good, that an enormous rabbit would come and deliver them a basket of eggs. Because in the old days, they also used to really revere uh, eggs. I'll tell you why I like Easter. The candy, totally. For some reason all the best candy comes out around Easter time. You know what I'm talking about. Cadsbury eggs and peeps. So good. I love Easter. I am known for my egg people. <laughs> like this one. This is actually puppy dog egg. <laughs> 
This is Santa Claus egg. <laughs> this is Abraham Lincoln egg. And this is dun, da, 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 Claire Danes egg. And in order to keep track, the Easter Bunny would make a list and check it twice. And then he would uh, hide the eggs uh, because people back then really, really valued looking for things. Yeah, to me, this day is going to be special because it represents the day when Jesus rose from the dead, thereby bringing life and hope to the entire world. Um, I think that's probably enough, isn't it? Peeps. Yellow marshmallows over resurrection. Hmm. <laughs> Just a little fun in the middle of this to be able to laugh and to realize, you know, Easter is not just the Easter bunny and big dinners and dressy clothes like it has been in so many years. It's been very, very different this year, but in many ways, like we shared last week, we've gotten back to some of the most basic understandings of Easter and what the resurrection truly means to us. Easter isn't actually just a Sunday of the year. That's what we think of. Easter is actually a season of the church year. And so it's seven weeks long, and during that time, we celebrate Easter in lots of different ways. What we typically do is follow the times that Jesus appeared to the disciples, and maybe we look at other scriptures and what Easter led to in the church. This year, I want to share with you that we're going to continue in Easter until we come back together again face-to-face -face in worship. And I understand that may take weeks. It may even take months. But we're going to continue to look at the way that Christ appeared to the disciples. And we're going to follow through the rest of the Gospel of John the next several weeks. Then we're going to go through Matthew, Mark, and Luke until we reach the point of what we call Pentecost Sunday. That's the day that the disciples had gathered together and the Holy Spirit came and rested on them and they became the church. So as we prepare for that time that we're able to come back together when God calls us to be the church again in that way, that during that time we're going to look at the way that God shows up over and over and over again in the most unlikely times and places. Today is one of those stories. And so we begin this series of Easter that's going to go until we come back together again. And as we go through this, I want you to begin to look for the ways that God shows up even in this unlikely time and these unlikely places in which we find ourselves today. The scripture that you heard Joni read is, is a good one. It's one that reminds us of that story that we all know as Doubting Thomas. Uh, the video at the beginning of the service that we shared on YouTube that you probably heard on the radio station too is, is also a reminder to us that Thomas is the most famous skeptic there is. And it comes from the Gospel of John. We shared the Easter story, the resurrection story last week from John. So you may remember that Mary went to the tomb and she was there and found that the tomb was empty, ran back to tell the disciples. They didn't believe it, so several of them ran, found the tomb empty, and they went back. And so we find ourselves immediately after that, on that Sunday night, after they found the, the tomb empty, after Jesus appeared to Mary... They were talking about what was going on, asking themselves the question, what if what God is doing is bigger and better than we ever would have expected it to be? What if God really did raise Jesus from the dead? That night they're gathered in, and so there are two parts to the scripture that, that Joni Buby read. The first is that it was that first night when the disciples were together, and it doesn't tell us exactly how many there were. It does tell us that Thomas was absent. But Jesus appears to them, and as he comes in, he says, Peace be with you. He showed him his hands and his side. So that's where the nails had pierced him, where he had been pierced in the side. And as he shows them those things, they're filled with joy. And Jesus said, Peace be with you again. As the Father sent me, I'm sending you. And so he breathed on them and said, Re receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive sins, they're forgiven. If you, if you don't, they won't be. And, and that's the end of that moment 
where they believe because Jesus has showed up with them. Now, as I said, we don't know how many were there. As you've seen from the picture on the altar, we have a lot of candles up here today. There are 11 candles representing the 11 remaining disciples that we will be experiencing over the next several weeks as Jesus reappears to them before he ascends into heaven, and we have Pentecost Sunday soon after that. Well, Thomas is one who's not there. And so Thomas is with them, and they keep saying, we've seen the Lord. Just like Mary said, we've seen the Lord. They were all skeptical. Jesus came, showed up. They saw him. They believed. Now they're saying it. And Thomas says, unless I see what you saw, I don't believe it. It's it's too big, maybe too good to be true. And so that's where I want us to focus today. Right after he says, unless I see the nail marks in his hands, put my finger in the wounds left by the nails, and I put my hand into his side, I won't believe. So not only do I have to see it, I have to touch it. And do you notice what Jesus does? It's eight days later in John's story here. They're in a house. Thomas is with them. And the doors are locked. But Jesus appears again. And what does he say? Peace be with you. Same words, same call. Thomas hears it. He's heard the story. And then he says to Thomas, put your finger here. Look at my hands. Put your hand into my side. No more disbelief. Believe. And Thomas's response is one of full belief. He says, my Lord and my God. And, and in that moment, Jesus reaches out to him. Then he says, do you believe because you see me? Happy are those who don't see, and yet they believe. Now, we have, over the years, thought that this means that Thomas is the ultimate skeptic, the ultimate doubter. So we call him Doubting Thomas. That's where that phrase comes from. And over the years, we've thought that there's something wrong with that. Like Jesus was saying to him, Boy, it took this much to get you to believe? Oh, blessed, remember that's like happy and blessed are those who don't see me and yet believe. And so we think that it's almost like a diss against Thomas. And yet, and yet, don't forget that the other disciples believed because they saw Jesus too. And it was... To Thomas, it was unbelievable that not only had Jesus appeared to them and spoken to them, but he saw the scars. One of the differences that happens in this is because the scars, he's not some ghost just wandering around that's, that's been healed completely. He still has the scars. It's Jesus. He's not just been changed into some other form. It's the real Jesus, and he still has the scars. He knows what he did to get there. And in seeing those scars, he proves to them that he's not just transfigured or changed. He was brought back to life. The most unbelievable. I mean, it would almost be easier to believe that Jesus had been turned into a ghost or a spirit. But he was alive again. And then the scripture tells us that Jesus goes on to do other miracles their belief is stronger. So if Thomas, being doubting Thomas, the Thomas, the ordinary skeptic of the group, is the one that we kind of push down in this and almost make fun of or make light of, what else could it be? When Jesus appeared to the other disciples, this is what he said, peace be with you, just like he said to Thomas, As the Father sends me, so I'm sending you. Jesus has this beautiful saying in the middle of this passage that gets overlooked because of our our laser focus on doubting Thomas. And that is that just as the Father sent Jesus to show people how to believe, He's sending us as proof of how to believe. Now think about that. 
It's absolutely amazing the trust that God is putting in you and in me to say to us, now it's your turn to go and show the people to believe in Jesus raised from the dead. Blessed are those who don't see Jesus directly, but who see Jesus through you, through me, through the church. I shared with you some in the devotional this week about how it it surprised me in some ways that so many people were reporting that Easter was somber and sad, and yet we gathered together and celebrated the the risen Christ as a sign of our hope that we will be delivered from this, just like the Israelites were delivered from bondage into the promised land, just like Jesus was raised from the dead, we as Christians are going to move through this period and we're going to come alive again. As a matter of fact, this time that we have where we're looking for God to show up in unlikely places and unlikely ways makes us no ordinary skeptic. It's okay to be skeptical. It's okay to have doubts. It's okay to have fears. But we place our hope in things much greater than what the world gives to us. We place our hope in the one who delivers, God Almighty. When when Thomas believes, he says, my Lord and my God, he's ready to follow, to serve But what Jesus has told him, he told the disciples before them, eight days before, he tells us today is simple. I'm sending you. You are going to tell people what you have seen, what you believe, and my spirit will work through you to let them believe, and they will be blessed even though they didn't see it directly. In this time in which the doors of the church have been closed up for safety, the church is coming alive in all new ways. Last Sunday, I asked you to think of the ways that you can start to make plans on what you want to do differently as you come out of this COVID-19 health crisis. What are we as a church going to do differently? Now, we don't know when we're going to open up yet, and certainly there's been a lot of hope and excitement about talk this week of making plans for how we open the gates back up, how we start to unfold. And it will come in phases, gently. Our leadership will be in a meeting this week and in the the next few weeks to come to make our plans as well. But rest assured, we're going to be cautious and gentle, but we're going to look at our situation and ask ourselves the question, where has God shown up during this? And how can we continue that witness of our faith so others can believe? Don't be an ordinary skeptic. Don't be one who thinks that because you have questions or doubts or fears, because you're skeptical about the things you hear on the news or the things you hear from your neighbor, that somehow that that skepticism overwhelms you and you start to think, we may never make it out of this. Be a skeptic like Thomas and say, when God shows me, I'll believe. And then open your eyes because I'm here to tell you today that God is showing you that there's nothing that's going to separate us from the love of God. I watch people over and over and over again come up and work in the blessing box. Yesterday in our our Saturday morning breakfast, they served 89 to-go breakfasts. I mean, it, it started off slow, but it's building back up. People are finding out that this is where you can come when you need food. And we are praying for those who have lost their jobs, who are struggling with food, and we're going to continue to do everything we can to serve because that's what makes us the Easter people. We are the sign of hope. When Jesus says, peace be with you, as my Father sent me, so I'm sending you, our response is, just like Peter, my Lord, my God, how can I serve you? And Jesus is telling us, tell that story that Jesus is alive, that the people of Israel were delivered, and that you and I will be made new in this. 
Now, we're not an ordinary skeptic. We're extraordinary skeptics. And it's okay to be skeptical as long as you say like Thomas, when I see it, I'll believe it. Don't close your eyes in skepticism. Open them up and look for the ways that God is working in brand new ways through us. My friends, I believe that we're going to look back on this time in our congregation and say, we changed during that and we became a better, stronger, more Christ-like body. This last week in my youth group, we met on Zoom and I hope some of y'all are considering ways that you can get together in lots of different ways. Zoom certainly has been an effective way. We met together, and we began to talk about the fact that we hear so much of people saying, God made this happen to teach us a lesson. Now, I understand why people think that God could make make bad things happen, and certainly you read through the Old Testament, and you, you see it through the Old Testament eyes, and you begin to hear that God does punish. But through the Christian eyes today, through Jesus' eyes, Jesus was so much more focused on grace. Sometimes bad things happen because of consequences of our actions. Maybe we're living too closely together. Maybe we're not living closely enough. In our small group, we began to talk about the lessons we can learn, no matter why this happened. Certainly, it happened because of consequences of the world we live in and the problems we have. But what can we learn from this? And my youth, mostly ninth graders, all of them ninth graders right now, uh, all began to say, well, maybe it's time for us to get to know each other better. I mean, we gather together and we're so busy, but maybe we could learn more about how to get closer to each other. I mean, what a powerful lesson to learn in that. Can you not see that, that we're being forced out of our busyness to reprioritize? And I believe it's time for us to show the world how we love God, how we love others, and how we serve the world. That's our vision here at First United Methodist Church. Love God, love others, serve the world. It's becoming so clear that God is appearing to us over and over again through the blessing box, through our breakfast ministries, through the Zoom calls, through our phone calls, through our cards, through the way that we can see each other in new ways and realize how important it is that we live and we learn and we love together. So know this, Easter's not over. (laughs) It's a a Christian season that lasts for seven weeks, but more than that, we are an Easter people who are not going to give up. And we're going to continue to look for the ways that God shows up in unlikely times and unlikely places and unlikely ways until God brings us together ready to do a new thing with us, just like on that first day of Pentecost. Easter lives, my friends. Easter lives in you. Easter lives in me. Easter lives in our congregation. Easter lives in the church throughout the world as we are a living, breathing example of Christ. I want you to watch one more video of our man on the street video as we close out. Uh, As Joel has asked different people this week, I want you to hear somebody who, who is not a Christian answer some of the questions and pay special attention to what we can do for the world in this. Five Questions with Vincent Wynn. What's good about these days? Um... What do you mean these days? Like like right now, dealing with the COVID virus and all that? Um, spend more time with family and getting to, um, I suppose, it, have more free time. I've saved a lot more money because I don't spend more. I've, I mean, I suppose that's pretty good. Well, what worries you? Um, what worries me about all this yeah. is uh, people their lack of belief that it is a real thing. I've seen a lot of people who do like on social media that believe that it's not real, that it's, it's all a big conspiracy and not believing in it. Right on. What gives you hope? Science. There you go. What can Christians do in times like this? They can do what they do. I mean, (laughs) 
I suppose praying helps them, so I suppose pray. And what can we as Christians help you with? Don't leave it in God's hands. Wash your hands. <laughs> Don't leave it in God's hands. Wash your hands. Do you know what I hear in that? I hear somebody that's looking at the church right now to ask us if we're just an ordinary skeptic. If we're going to buck the system, if we're going to stand up and say, you know what, we're going to meet anyway. I, I don't think that that's what our congregation is going to choose to do. We're going to live by example. We're going to be skeptics, but no ordinary skeptic. We're going to be skeptical in making sure that we are keeping each other safe and secure. We're going to wash our hands. We're going to keep our distance. Our leaders will be meeting to talk about ways that we safely, carefully come back into a time of gathering together again. But we do so in a way that loves God, loves others, and serves the world, that protects our neighbors. I mean, this is the time for, watch, for us to watch for the ways that God shows up, but it's also the time for us to show up in the name of Jesus Christ to show our love for each other and for our neighbor and for God. So know this, Easter is not over. Easter continues. And as we move through this journey, we're going to continue to find more and more reason to celebrate and to say the great words, my Lord and my God. And so others can see through us to the living Christ, a cross that is free and clear, a life that is available to all that nothing in this world can take away from us. So as we prepare for the next week and the week after, I encourage you to open your eyes and not be an ordinary skeptic, but to look for the way that God shows up. And when you see it, do what Jesus told the disciples to do. Be sent so that others may believe as you witness to your faith in the God who shows up. May God bless you this week. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, let us pray. God, thank you so much for the way that you show up in our lives, even in the midst of the struggle and pain and anxiety that we face. Help us to see more and more examples of the way that you are working in and among and through us. Help us not to be an ordinary skeptic that simply complains and closes their eyes and crosses their arms, but help us to be an extraordinary skeptic who looks carefully and sees the things that are changing, sees the new life, the resurrection all around us, so that when we proclaim our faith, others may believe with us. In the name of God we pray. Amen. Some of us are okay, some of us are not. This is an Easter prayer for both. May God take the hope that pours out of the empty tomb and pour it into your life in surprising ways. May the healer comfort you during this season, and may his compassion remind you that this is only a season. May the Lord sustain those who are without jobs, and may his sustaining mercies appear new every morning. May the Lord awaken us to the miracle of Easter, and may we believe now more than ever in the timeless, limitless power of the Almighty. Where there is fear, let faith win the day. Where there is anxiety, let peace prevail. 
Where there is wisdom, let it be multiplied. Where there is despair, let joy break throughout. May God draw near to the brokenhearted, and may you fully know the reassurance of His presence. May the Spirit breathe new life into your normal, and may your heart be resurrected with confidence and courage. Lord, hear our cry. Heal our world. Lord, be glorified. Amen.